So today, guys, we're going to have part two of our EKG review. And in this lecture, I am going to discuss the characteristics of the cardiac dysrhythmias, signs and symptoms, some of the causes, um, some of the clinical associations and clinical significance of the cardiac dysrhythmias. And then I'm going to talk about treatments. Um, remember, treatments are always going to be individualized. So this is your general basic treatments that I believe that are testable. If you feel that you need a review on anatomy and physiology, um, cardiac conduction cycle, blood flow through the heart, um, waveform or measurement or interpretation um, in, in that real detail, preload, afterload, contractility, any of that, you should refer back to the EKG review part one because in this video, I am not really talking about um, the, that part of it. I'm just pretty much talking about how it looks for the patient and how we're going to treat it. Um, I'm going to make this one short and sweet. And so um, if you have any questions, guys, please respond and let me know um, so that I can further assist you in talking about rhythms. And this is my favorite. So let's get going. So the first one we're going to start off with is going to be sinus bradycardia. And we have discussed sinus bradycardia before. Remember, sinus bradycardia is going to be pretty much everything is regular. So you have your, your, rate, your rhythm is regular. Your rate is less than 60. That's the most important part there. But your P waves are still there. They're before every QRS. They look alike. The PR interval is a normal range of 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 and constant. And the QRS complex is still less than 0 0.11. So the sinoatrial node is still firing off its electrical impulses. Remember, the sinoatrial node is the pacemaker of the heart. And instead of firing off electrical impulses between 60 and 100, it has decided, I'm going to slow down. I've been moving too fast. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm going to fire off rates that are less than 60. So that's what makes this a sinus bradycardia, okay? So you guys are like, okay, I want to do something because it's less than 60. Okay, so we're going to talk about what we can do for this. So let's see how sinus bradycardia looks. So this is basically how sinus bradycardia looks. We're gonna say that this is a regular six second strip. And we're not gonna count the first complex. We're gonna count the other one. So we have a heart rate roughly at about four. Remember using our um, six second strip multiplied by 10 is the uh, more common but least accurate way of interpreting the heart rate. So um, I know you wanna do something extra special for this patient because you want the heart rate to be at least 60. But I do want you to know that this cardiac dysrhythmia is normal in the very athletic person. Um, also, you are probably bradycardic when you sleep. So you definitely want to know that you are going to treat your patient and not the monitor. So here's my little thing. You know, I like to throw my long little thing in here. Think about this. Remember I told you in part one that cardiac output was equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume. So cardiac output is equal to the heart rate times the stroke volume. So the slower the heart rate, the lower the cardiac output. Say that again. Cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. So the slower the heart rate, the less the cardiac output. So with that being said, we need to start thinking about and assessing if this patient is having signs and symptoms of a decrease in cardiac output, okay? So keep that in mind. Some of the things that can cause this bradycardia is any kind of vagal stimulation, drugs, um, so your beta blockers, your digoxins, um, if the myocardium is ischemic, or even if you are having an ischemic issue. So those are some of the things, but we're not, like I said, going to get all bent out of shape until we have our patients showing symptoms that they have a decrease in cardiac output. So with that being said, let's look at how does that look? So if the patient comes in complaining of mental status changes, level of consciousness changing, chest pain or discomfort, 
difficulty breathing, um, shortness of breath, dizziness, syncopal episodes. I kind of skipped over a decrease in urinary output. Uh, yeah, that is definitely a symptom of a decrease in cardiac output. But wow, that's going to be a, um, a later sign, but it's definitely on there as well. Um, some of the things that can possibly cause this is going to be a diseased SA node, electrolyte imbalances, hypothyroidism, um, and like we talked about, any kind of vagal stimulation. So once they start coming in complaining of these kind of symptoms, you want to now start thinking about treatment. So, once a patient becomes what we call symptomatic, we want to treat it. And the first thing we want to do is try to get our patient on some oxygen, because that's always a good idea. And then the drug of choice is going to be atropine. IV push, 0 0.5 milligrams every five minutes, but the max dose is going to be three milligrams. If by some chance we cannot keep our patient stable, possibly we may have to um, have this patient get a pacemaker, but the drug of choice is going to be atropine. And obviously anytime our patient is having signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output, we will want to put them on some oxygen. Alrighty, let's move over to sinus tachycardia. So I don't get too excited about sinus bradycardia and sinus tachycardia, but, you know, we got to talk about those. So with sinus tachycardia, once again, um, things are looking good. This is your regular rhythm. The rate is what makes this a sinus tachycardia because the rate is greater than 100. There still are P waves before every QRS, and they actually look alike. The PR interval is still 0.12 to 0 0.20 and it is constant. The QRS duration is still 0 0.11 or greater or less, I'm sorry, or less. So the only difference here with sinus tachycardia is the SA node has decided to get extra motivated and start firing off electrical impulses faster than it should. So the heart rate is greater than 100, okay? So let's look at some of the things that may cause this. Let's look at how it looks on the monitor. Here is sinus tachycardia on the monitor. And as you can see, guys, we have P waves identified on the strip. And this heart rate is about 110, if you count and use the six-second method. But the P waves are so close to the T waves that they're almost running into each other. So if this rate was 10, 15 beats higher, you wouldn't be able to tell P waves from T waves, okay? So some of the causes of sinus tachycardia is going to be um, stimulants, if the patient is taking a stimulant, um, exercising, fever, infection, um, any kind of exertion, shock, hypotension, anxiety, pain, um, pulmonary embolism. And then you definitely have to think about any drug that will increase the sympathetic tone. So that would be like your um, dopamine, your epinephrine, your norepinephrine, uh, unfortunately cocaine, so that kind of thing. And also think about any alterations in fluid status. Remember our body does respond um, to fluid status. So your body will say, uh-oh, where's my fluid? I'm going to be faster to get more perfusion. So think about that. As nurses, our job is going to be what? To assess for symptoms of low cardiac output. Now, the people that are actually paying attention, the ones that haven't fell asleep, and I get it, are saying, how in the world can you have a slow heart rate and have a decrease in cardiac output and have a fast heart rate and also have a decrease in cardiac output? I'm going to explain that to you first. I'm going to give you a second to think about it. Okay, you're absolutely right. Because, just like I pointed out earlier, the P waves are so close to the T waves, they're almost running together. So with that says, we know that the T wave is ventricular 
repolarization. The ventricles are relaxing and filling with blood. But before they can completely fill with blood, we're already getting ready to start the cycle all over again. So they're not getting their full fillment. They're not getting the full amount of volume before it's time for them to contract again. So if you don't have full ventricular filling, the full amount of volume, you eventually start to lose cardiac output. So yes, the faster the heart rate, the more severe those symptoms are going to be because the more cardiac output you're losing. I hope that that makes sense. Is it, if it doesn't, leave a comment and I will explain it further, I promise. So let's treat this. So treatment of sinus tachycardia. So we don't get really aggressive on it. We don't really try to blow into um, correcting the heart rate unless obviously the patient is unstable. So with that being said, some of the things that we do is we try to focus on what we call the underlying cause, the cause of the tachycardia. So we try to fix the pain, the pulmonary embolus, the shock, the fever, the infection. We try to look in that, give them something for the anxiety, whether it's you know reassurance, a benzo, or something like that. We try to figure out what's causing it. One of the things I want you to know that even though I put here we don't have an aggressive treatment, we try to treat the underlying cause, Sinus tachycardia is definitely a warning sign that something is going on in the body. We do not ignore it. We don't ignore it, and we especially don't ignore it in our cardiac patients. Because I want you to walk away with this. An increase in heart rate also increases the workload of the heart. And if you have an increase in workload of the heart, you also have an increase in oxygen demand of the heart. So with the already sick heart, that's not a good thing. And most important, the faster the heart rate, the decrease in the amount of time that we have ventricular filling. So that is very important about the sinus um, tachycardia. You also can put over in your little margin of notes because I definitely want you to know this. There are drugs that we can give if the patient has a heart rate that is so fast that they become unstable. And one of the things we try to do is we will give them um, a beta blocker. And um, we like to give low pressure in my world. Um, we like to give low pressure, IV push. Um, and if that doesn't work, occasionally we get ballsy. I will use that word and feel okay with it. And if we decide to go balls to the wall, we will give adenosine. Um, do a little homework on adenosine and you'll find out why I did call that balls to the wall. But that definitely will um, slow down the heart rate as well. And then if we have to, you know, go overboard, we can cardiovert this patient as well. Remember, I am talking about an unstable patient by the time we get to this because that is, you know, kind of ballsy as well. That is not your normal um, tachycardia of 110, 115 when I'm thinking about cardio. So we have pretty much talked about the two sinus dysrhythmias that we have. Um, so I want to make sure that we have a good understanding. We have a fast heart rate and we have a slow heart rate. Both of them end up showing us signs of a decrease in cardiac output. We don't like a decrease in cardiac output because we need our cardiac output to perfuse our vital organs. So but that being said, we are always trying to figure out a way to speed up the heart rate. With sinus bradycardia, remember, we do not treat it until the patient is symptomatic. And if we treat it, we give oxygen and atropine. And with our sinus tachycardia, we try to treat the cause of why the patient's heart rate has gone up. Um, and if the patient is completely, if the patient becomes unstable, we can, uh, we do have pharmacological methods that can slow down the heart rate. And that is going to be your low pressors or your adenosine, and we can definitely do synchronized cardioversion to slow down the heart rate as well. So now let's talk about our atrial rhythms, okay? So that's going to be your AFib, A flutter, and I like to refer to them as cousins. Kissing cousins, okay? So let's talk a little bit about them. 
First one we're going to hit is going to be my favorite, atrial fibrillation. Not 100% sure why atrial fibrillation is my favorite. It's my favorite, right? Like, I think I like the fibrillations because I also like V-fib. And when we get to that, I'll probably be talking all fast, but it's okay. Anyway, atrial fibrillation, let's talk about it. So we always talk about the rhythm. Remember, if you didn't get video one, you don't really quite know what I'm talking about when I say rhythm. But when I say rhythm, I am talking about is it a regular bump, 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 bump. Bump or is it irregular? Bump, 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 bump. Is it regular or is it irregular? And with atrial fibrillation, it's irregular. Okay. The atrial rate. Okay. So when we think about the atrial rate, it's high. Like we can't even count it. So many P waves. P waves are all over the place. We don't even know if that's P wave or T wave. It's just lots of wavy lines in between the QRSs. Okay. P waves, like I said, we can't identify them. The baseline, or what we um, call should be back to the isoelectric line, that line is wavy and erratic. Okay, there we can't look at a PR interval. I can't tell you if the person's old enough to drink or anything because there we can't see it. It's not measurable. And then the QRS duration is 0.11 or less. Okay, so the QRS is still a narrow complex. So if I had to give you a definition of what atrial fibrillation was, I would tell you that it is total disorganization of atrial electrical activity. And this is related to um, multiple, not one, not two, but multiple uh, etopic foci that is irritated in the atrium. So um, in the last video, I was explaining to you that when we have a foci, a point, that is irritated um, in the atria or the ventricles, you may have PACs or PVCs. So here we have multiple areas that are irritated. And the problem is we have lost the ability to have an effective atrial contraction. So although I mentioned that atrial fibrillation is my favorite cardiac dysrhythmia, it is the most common. So maybe that's why, because I see it a lot. Um, actually, my mother ended up having a little bout of it not too long ago. So it occurs 1.5 times more um, in men than in women. And that actually goes up as we increase in age, okay? With atrial fibrillation, it may come and it may go, um, and, or it may stay around. So that's pretty much what's going on with AFib. Let's see how it looks on the monitor. Let's look at the strip. So... This is going to be your atrial fibrillation on the monitor. This is a cardiac strip. Remember when I said that it is not regular. If you look at the first two QRS complexes, they're kind of close together. Third one, uh, kind of further apart. The fourth one, not so much. The next three are kind of close, and then the fifth, sixth one is not so close together. It's not regular. They do not, they're not evenly spaced apart. Okay, so that's what I meant when I said it is irregular. Notice also, we can't see, I don't see P waves. I see wavy lines. I see squiggly. I don't see, and I can't identify a P wave. And if you can't identify a P wave, there's no way that you can measure a PR interval. The clinical associations, things that um, usually go on with this, underlying issues with this, is going to be rheumatic heart fever, coronary artery disease cardiomyopathy and remember guys cardiomyopathy is just disease muscle disease heart muscle heart failure and pericarditis okay so then your clinical associations things that are usually um this is going to be caused by um your uncontrolled hyperthyroidism alcoholism definitely caffeine use excessive caffeine use that's going to be electrolyte imbalances Cardiac muscle is very sensitive to electrolyte imbalances, so definitely you will see that with the electrolyte imbalances. And then your patient who has a history or recently had a cardiac surgery is going to be at risk for, um, have an increased risk of going into atrial fibrillation. So clinical significance. Basically, why is this important to me as a nurse? Why do I care about atrial fibrillation? One, patient has lost what we call atrial kicks. I stated earlier to you that the patient loses the ability to have an effective 
atrial contraction because the atria is quivering it's shaking it's not contracting fully it's just sitting up there there is no contraction going on so if the atria is not completely contracting that means that blood is still sitting in there that means it's not completely emptying blood so with that being said with blood sitting there now the patient is at risk for clocks because the atria did not completely contract it left a little blood in there. The blood sat in there. Anytime blood sit, it clots. Okay, so now your patient is at risk for clots. If your patient is at risk for clots, your patient is at risk for throwing a ambuli, clots moving, and that can end up in the brain. And that's not a good thing because that's a stroke. Okay, cool. So we know that. The other thing that's important to me as a nurse is that I also told you with that ineffective atrial contraction, you lose atrial kick. And if you lose atrial kick, remember I was telling you that was about 15 to 20% of cardiac output? Okay, cool. If you lose that atrial kick, you lose some cardiac output. You've lost about 15, 20%. And if by some chance that heart rate, ventricular heart rate, is greater than 100, we call that uncontrolled AFib. Or you'll hear us also say that patient is a AFib with RVR with a rapid ventricular rate. So now, on top of the fact that we lost the atrial kick, the heart rate's beating fast, and we already said with a fast heart rate, we lose a little bit of cardiac output. So now we have a lot of cardiac output. So we can um, definitely start having symptoms with this. So we have two main things that we're worried about. We worried about the rate, and we learned about clock formation. Okay, so that is pretty much what our goal is going to be focused on when we are thinking of treating this dysrhythmia. So let's look at some of the things that patients are coming in complaining of. Yeah, you said it. All the things that say that they could have a decrease in cardiac output. So these are all the things we kind of said at first, the uh, chest discomfort. The only thing that's added on there, as you can see, is palpitations. So one of the things your patient may come in saying is I can feel my heart beating in my chest. Oh my gosh, that's my heart's kind of fluttering. I can feel that. So that's the added bonus there. Syncopal episodes, um, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, all of going to be your classic symptoms of a decrease in cardiac output. So first thing we want to do is remember when our patient goes into AFib, if they actually happen on our shift, we want to try to see if we can get a cardiology consult. And remember, guys, the treatment is going to be based on the rate of the ventricular rate. So that's kind of we're, we're kind of leading in that direction. If it is a uncontrolled rate, we're going to want to control the rate. So obviously, we'll do oxygen first, IV excess, put our patient on a monitor. And anytime our patient is having any kind of cardiac dysrhythmia, we should be making sure that our patient have IV access. And even with that assess IV access that's already there, or we may even want to add more IV access. So then we want to think about the rate. In controlling the rate, we want to think about calcium channel blockers. And the one we um, enjoy is going to be diltiazem or cardizem. We may use a beta blocker. And the beta blocker of choice is usually going to be low pressor or metoprolol. And... We might actually use digoxin, although I see us moving a little bit away from that. But you know, digoxin has the ability to slow down the heart rate at the AV node and also to increase contractility. So uh, remember, you're losing cardiac output. Sometimes you do want a better contraction. If none of that stuff works out really well for us, we will try to convert this rhythm back to sinus rhythm. That's when I say convert the rhythm. That is what I'm referring to. We can convert the rhythm with amiodarone. That's going to be pharmacological. Or we may get really ballsy and decide to synchronize cardioversion this patient. And I will talk a little bit more and explain synchronized cardioversion. But basically, it is the baby sister to defibrillation. We are giving this patient a jolt of electricity, much smaller amount than we are giving for defibrillation. Because all we want to do is we want to say, hey, 
and say, no, could you take back over and do your job? I don't know what's going on or why everybody is trying to do your job. But can you take back over and do your job and get this right? Okay, cool, you can. Good job, way to go. So we would like for that to be the case. That does not always happen. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't successfully happen at all. And that's how the patient could end up staying in a fit. So we can't just be shocking hearts and telling them to do what they're supposed to be doing if we haven't decided that there is no clot in a chamber. So one of the things we have to do before we can cardiovert this patient is to make sure they have been anticoagulated. If the patient has been in, hear me out, AFib for longer than two days, 48 hours, we need to anticoagulate them for about three weeks. So sometimes they get really cool and they'll throw them on an IV heparin at the hospital by the time we send them home. We can give them some Coumadin. There are other oral um, anticoagulants now, guys. Um, have them come back in on an outpatient basis, and we can do the cardioversion. So one of the things we like to do before we get to shock in the heart again is to make sure there's no clot there. So we've anticoagulated them. We're also going to take a nice little camera scope, and we're going to do a transesophageal echocardiogram. So we get a little camera. Um, remember, this is going to go down the esophagus. Remember, the heart lays on top of the esophagus. Yeah, of course you know that. And you can see what's going on in the heart, look around and be nosy and see if any clots are hanging out there. And obviously, if there are clots, we're not going to be cardioverting. And so that's the thing. Usually, even after the cardioversion, they like for about a month afterward to also anticoagulate that. Guys, if your instructor do, decides to test, amy, um, to test atrial fibrillation, this is what they're going to test. The patient's at risk for clots. If we need to cardiovert them, we need to anticoagulate them. If they stay in AFib, they need to be anticoagulated forever. Rate control, anticoagulation, at risk for clots, decrease in cardiac output, that kind of stuff. Um, may actually have you look on um, a strip and identify. Remember, it is not a regular rhythm. It is usually not a regular rhythm. Okay. Are we excited yet? Yay. I guess I got a little bit above myself there. You know, I, I kind of know this stuff off the top of my head, so it kind of messes me up sometimes. Okay. I'll let you look at it, though, because I was going through it kind of quick. Like I said, those last two lines, that is usually what your instructor is going to test. Let's talk about his cousin, AFib, a flutter. So with atrial flutter, there is a little difference here, guys, and I want you to kind of pay attention with me. With atrial flutter, it is a regular rhythm, okay? You still don't know um, P's from T's and all of that. We have what they call flutter waves. Um, people like to say it is sawtooth. I like to say it looks like a white picket fence at the top. Yeah, I'm kind of goofy. All right. All right. Anyway, so um, it is regular because we normally can say there are four flutter waves to one QRS. And let me tell you what I mean when I say that. Four to one. Four to one. Four to one. So that's why I say this one is a regular rhythm. It is regular. Um, some of the things that are going to be associated, and this, like I said, it is AFib's cousin, pretty much the same treatment, pretty much the same goals, uh, pretty much the same signs and symptoms. Um, things that are associated with it are definitely going to be PEs, chronic lung disease, cardiomyopathy, hyperthyroidism, mitral valve disorders, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and pericarditis. So pretty much the same things in that way. And like I said, the treatment is pretty much the same as well. The treatment. Primary goal is going to be, once again, to slow the ventricular rate. Um, you're also going to slow your heart rate, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. And if you are having symptoms that your patient becomes unstable, um, severe hypotension, signs and symptoms of shock or heart failure, you may have to cardiovert them as well. The goals and things do not change. You are still going to do the exact same thing to make sure your patient is anticoagulated. 
so on and so forth. This may be uh, emergency or it may be elective. It just depends on, once again, on how your patient is tolerating the ventricular rate. Okay, we're getting excited now. We're going to talk about these AV blocks. Who's excited? Me. Okay, cool. So, atrial ventricular blocks. I will let you guys know, pre-licensure, this is not going to be a lot of testing questions on here. But I make smart nurses, so I'm going to tell you some stuff about them. Um, the There are four AV blocks. There's the first degree, there's the second degree, and there's two types of second degree. And then there is the third degree. The third degree, you might hear me say the third degree heart block, or you might hear me say the complete heart block. I go back and forth between them. So just in case I do, you will know what I'm talking about. If I had to sum up heart blocks, I would say to you that basically there is a delay or a failed conduction between the atria and the ventricles. And so basically there's a break in the communication. Somehow... Sometimes the atria just, the impulses that the SA node sends out does not make it down to the ventricles. And that, you know, that causes a problem, you know, because remember, atria and ventricles, guys, they're supposed to be joined together. They march along, bump, 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 bump. They're holding hands, they're married, they're doing a great job. So if somehow bump is not talking to bump, we have a problem. So with the first degree AV block, all of those electrical impulses make it through. The way we identify these blocks is going to be exactly where is the failed conduction at. Is it the AV junction? Is it the bundle branches? Or is it the bundle of hits? So that's pretty much what we're working with. With the second degree AV block, some of the impulses make it through to the ventricle, some don't. And then with the third degree AV block, none of the impulses are making it through. Now, you know, that just doesn't work, okay? So, this could be a temporary thing and may be permanent, but it all depends on the delay in the sinus node impulses making it down to the ventricles. And I will explain to you a little bit more as we talk about exactly what I mean about that. So this next slide that I put in here for you guys, it pretty much breaks it down and pretty much tells you exactly what's going on with your blocks. So... First degree AV block, everything looks great. Everybody is happy. Everything, we have a um, P wave for your SA node send everything out. But the catch is, remember, the PR interval is supposed to be old enough to think, but not old enough to drink. But with the first degree AV block, PR interval is drinking. Yes, it's longer than 0.20. In the first degree AV block, Everything looks good except the PR interval is greater than, is longer than 0.20. And all of them are, every complex. The first complex is 0.22, the second complex is 0.22, the third complex is 0.22. We don't do a lot of stuff for that. We don't really treat that one. With your second degree AV blocks, there is two types. And for some strange reason, sometimes we don't have P waves, sometimes we don't have QRS waves, all kind of goofy stuff is going on. Um, the type 2, the Mobitz type 2 is more serious than the Mobitz type 1. And the block is getting more severe. So it's not just a delay, like in type 1, there is some issues. Some, Like I said, some of the impulses make it through and some of the impulses don't. With your third degree AV block, like I said, nothing is making it through. And that's going to be your little cheat sheet. If you guys want me to email this to you, I could. Okay. This is a great picture. I like this picture. It kind of showed you that is normal sinus rhythm at the front, at the top. The second one is your first degree AV block. The second one, is, the third one is the second degree. And then the fourth one is the third degree. Usually a patient with your first degree AV block is going to be associated with a patient who has possibly taking um, digoxin or a patient who is taking a little bit too much low pressure. So um, could possibly have a 
a, a MI, hyperthyroidism. We may have to hold drugs, read, look at the drugs and see what's going on. Third degree. I really want to talk about the third degree because as an instructor, I love to test the third degree. And I don't know, I tell my students that all the time and they still miss it. But anyway, with the third degree AV block, Atria is doing its own thing. Ventricles is doing its own thing. They have decided to get divorced. So I think progressively they get upset with each other. There's a delay in communication and we know about communication, right? So first we just kind of be like, oh, we're not going to talk for 20, you know, 0.22 seconds, uh, whatever. And then we go longer and longer. Eventually we stop even talking. We don't have a P wave. Sometimes we don't have a QRS wave whatever. Well, in the third degree AV block, the SA node said, look, I got me. I'm firing off electrical impulses, 60 to 100. Me, me, me. I don't care if you get them or not. The ventricles, they like, okay, cool. Do you. I'm doing me. I'm firing off electrical impulses, 20 to 40. I'm doing me. So obviously, there's going to be more P waves than QRS, and we get cardiac output from where? You got it, QRS. So that's not going to work. So SA node is firing out bloop, 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 and we have ventricles, shoo, shoo. So that's not going to work. This patient needs a pacemaker. So if by some chance your instructor shows you a strip where there is two QRS and there are five, six, eight, ten P waves, that's probably going to be a third degree heart block. SA node is doing its own thing. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say firing off its intrinsic rate, Look at video one. The intrinsic rate for the SA note is 60 to 100. So it's firing off electrical impulses, 60 to 100. Fire, 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 fire. The ventricle's intrinsic rate is 20 to 40. It is showing, throwing off its electrical impulses, 20 to firing, 20 to 40. Whoosh. Whoosh. They're doing their own thing. They're not communicating at all. We get cardiac output from the ventricles. We cannot sustain life with a heart rate of 20 to 40. The answer to treating this heart rate is oxygen, atropine, pacemaker. And you can actually say in that order. Oxygen, atropine, pacemaker. Now your instructor might even say to you at one point, it's very controversial if we should give atropine because if atropine makes the SA note fire faster and the SA note has gotten mad and is not talking to the ventricles, how does that get to them? I feel that exact same way, but different literature is saying different things. We are hoping that one of those impulses make it down to the ventricle and speed up. The ultimate goal is for this patient to get a pacemaker. Oxygen atropine pacemaker. Okay, if you have any questions, please respond. Let me know. I will explain it further for you. Now we get down to the bottom, down to the nitty gritty. I'm excited. Okay, so ventricular dysrhythmias. We are going to talk about ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. So first thing we're going to do is, these are our last two guys, so stay with me. I know lots of information, lots of information. You may rewind, pause, or whatever. And if you need to, guys, don't forget, you can always email me at dshamel at yahoo.com, and I will clarify anything that you need. Let's talk about ventricular tachycardia. So we talked about PVCs. Anytime there are three or more PVCs, we call that a run of VTAC. Now, here's the thing. VTAC is regular. It can march out. The actual rhythm is below the ventricles. It does not initiate above the ventricles. So you can't see the P waves. They may be there, but you can't see them. No P waves can't measure a PR interval. Now, note, this whole day I've been telling you that everything had a narrow QRS that was less than 0.11. I'm going to tell you that ventricular tachycardia has a QRS that is 
wide and greater than 0.12. This is considered a life-threatening dysrhythmia. It can possibly, definitely you're going to have some um, cardiac output issues, but it can possibly deteriorate to ventricular fibrillation, so we definitely have to treat it. But let's look at it. Let's see how it looks. And that is pretty much how it looks, okay? We also call this VTAC, okay? So that is definitely one that we look at. We call this one VTAC. Like I said, it is um, regular. It is repetitive firing of the irritated ventricles. The ventricles definitely are irritated and pissy at this point. Um, the beats could be probably 100 to 140. Um, there are lots of things that could cause this, but one of the things I want you to look at is that the patient could have um, dish toxicity going on, a central nervous system disorder um, going on, ca uh, cardiomyopathy, electrolytes, electrolytes, electrolyte imbalances. All of these have been associated with electrolyte imbalances. If you are having issues with your electrolytes, we also have a video up. Uh, MI's coronary artery disease. So the first thing I want you to do when your patient is in ventricular tachycardia, like I said, we do not treat the monitor. We treat patients. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to go and assess, is there a pulse? That is very important because if there is a pulse, we will treat it one way. And if there is not a pulse, we will treat it another way. So that is the first thing that I want you to do when assessing this rhythm is to find out is there a pulse or is there not a pulse. So I'd like you to see if the patient is pulseless. If this patient does not have a pulse, you treat this patient as if they are in ventricular fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation, which we will talk about in a minute. If this patient does have a pulse, you want to find out, is this patient stable or is this patient unstable? Unstable, obviously, is going to be signs and symptoms of a decrease in cardiac output, a systolic blood pressure that is less than 90, um, level of consciousness changes. Uh, what about, is the patient warm? Are they complaining of chest pain? Are they short of breath? Are they dizziness? So that kind of stuff, those are the things that we're going to be looking at. So your stable patient, you're always going to make sure that you have them on O2. There is IV access, and you could start them on a antidysrhythmic. And if the patient is unstable, you're going to do O2, IV access, sedation, and synchronized cardioversion. Uh-oh. Here is our ventricular fibrillation. Okay, guys, this is our last rhythm that we are going to cover. Okay, so V-fib. It is very important. Oh, well, sort of our last rhythm. But anyway, it is very important that you um, be able to recognize V-fib when you see it. There is nothing to talk about. It's chaotic electrical activity going on in the heart. SA node is not doing anything. AV node is not doing anything. Ventricles, uh, meaning the... Pekinji network, they're not doing anything. So nobody's doing anything that is organized. It is chaotic. We call this one V-fib. There is electrical activity in the heart. It's just not organized. And the most important thing I want you to know about ventricular fibrillation is you have seconds to get electricity to this heart. And with that being said, when you hear V-fib, you should be thinking D-fib. V-fib, D-fib, because if you lose the electricity in the heart, there is nothing to organize. So with defibrillation, that's what you're doing. You are telling the heart to stop, get your act together, and say, no, please take over. At this point, you'll take anybody taking over. You'll take the AV node, you'll take some Pekinji network, you'll take anything at this point. It could be junctional, whatever. There's a million rhythms, guys. But anyway, you want some kind of organized pattern to come in here. Okay, so you're hoping that that is the goal. If you lose that electricity, you have nothing to organize, okay? So there is no effective contraction going on, hence there's no cardiac output. The patient's clinical manifestations, the patient is unresponsive, pulseless, apneic, um, and will die if you do not treat accordingly. Technically, they are dead, okay, but we're going to try to save them because we're going to be great nurses. 
immediately we need to start CPR and get defibrillation to this chest and start the ACLS protocol, which I will try desperately hard not to get into. But we have a whole song and dance, guys. Um, definitely not pre-licensure um, ready for you guys to know. But um, we have a whole song and dance that we do. It's a recipe of happiness, and we hope that it ends in happiness. Doesn't always. If we do not get electricity to the heart in a timely fashion, we end up what we call with ventricular asystole or ventricular standstill. So with asystole, guys, I don't care how many times you see it on television, you can't shock it. I know, Grey's Anatomy, House, Hawthorne, they're shocking asystole. They're like, flatline! Nope. Doesn't happen. The only thing you can do for asystole is do some CPR. Give some drugs and pray that it work out for you. Um, there is no electrical activity in the heart. See, there's nothing moving around. So if there is no electrical activity in the heart, there is nothing to organize. There's nothing to, to get control of. So you, you're not even going to tell the AV no to get its act together because it can't get its act together because it's not doing anything. No one's doing anything. So um, CPR is and drugs are what we are going to do for a systole. So let's talk about synchronized cardio version because we did. We talked. We I kept saying let's cardio vert them. Let's synchronize cardio vert them. Let's defibrillate them. So let me talk a little bit about that before we end this, just so that you guys have a pretty good idea of what synchronized cardio version is so if you look at your rhythm that i put up here you have um, atrial fibrillation wavy baseline they're not evenly spaced apart and we're going to shock them right there in the middle and then we're hoping they'll go back and sinus rhythm on the end yay so cardio version is the delivery of a measure so a predetermined amount of electrical activity in the chest. When we say that it is synchronized, we want it to happen. We want it to sync with the R wave. That's going to be the top of the QRS complex. The way this is done is it's done just like defibrillating a patient. We put the two, you know, defibrillator pads on the patient. The exact same thing goes on. The only thing is it will not deliver a shock until it is synchronized at the same time as the R wave. So even if you fire, you have to turn it on synchronized. You turn the defibrillator on synchronized. So usually you'll have somewhere between 50 jolts of energy to maybe about 150. Um, and I'll probably say maybe to about 100. Whereas with your defibrillation, you're going to have much larger amounts and like 300 jolts of energy with your defibrillation you um also have a large amount of energy and it can happen you can defibrillate anywhere in the cardiac cycle with synchronized cardioversion you have to synchronize you have to deliver that shock on the r wave you have to deliver that shock on the r wave it shows us on there we don't have to think real hard it'll show us little when we push the sync button it'll show on top of the r wave the little lines that says it's synchronizing with defibrillation you can give that jolt of energy anywhere in the cardiac cycle wouldn't be me without a cute little picture to show the difference between the two cardioversion can be elective can be emergency as well synchronized with the qrs there's your amount of energy. Oh, sometimes we can get a consent, sometimes we can't. And then with your defibrillation, it's emergency. That is V-fib and pulseless VTAC. No cardiac output. You're beginning with energy levels way large. Patient is unconscious, so they can't consent. Okay, I want you guys to walk away with a couple of things before we end this lecture. And thank you for coming. We only shot two rhythms ventricular fibrillation v-fib d-fib immediately and pulseless v-tac ventricular tachycardia without a pulse those are the only two rhythms we shock despite what you may see on television those are the only two shockable rhythms next thing i want you to walk away with 
Your patient's heart rate can be 52. If they are not symptomatic, we normally don't treat them. Um, my best friend runs marathons. Heart rate's probably about 50. -ish. So remember that we only treat a slow heart rate, which we call sinus bradycardia, when the patient is symptomatic, showing signs and symptoms that they are having a decrease in cardiac output. We treat it with oxygen. We treat it with atropine, 0.5 milligrams every five minutes at a max three dose. Sinus tachycardia, fast heart rate. One of the things we want to do is figure out why the heart rate is fast. We're going to treat why the heart rate is fast. If the patient is unstable, we will try and give some drugs to slow it down. I said a beta blocker, usually we can go over to adenosine, but that's kind of ballsy. We could even cardiovert them. But our main thing is to treat why is this heart rhythm fast, okay? So then we went on and we talked about AFib and A-flutter. We're losing atrial kick with both of those atrial rhythms. We are going to try to make sure the rate is controlled if that is an issue. Um, and we are going to make sure that we are anticoagulating this patient because they are at risk for having clots. We talked about those blocks, and I bet you was like, man, she went over those blocks so quick. Trust me, there is some kind of communication delay or problem with the atria and the ventricles, guys. And the, a the first degree AV block, not a really big deal. Third one needs a pacemaker. The ones in between, some are making them through, some are not making them through, okay? First thing we want to look at is what drugs is cause, could be causing this delay, this slowness or whatever. Atropine is thrown in there because it speeds up things. But the ultimate goal as the patient progresses from two um, type one and type two to complete heart block is thinking about a pacemaker. We talked about our ventricular dysrhythmia. Ventricular dysrhythmias are bad, guys, because that means that the issue, the problem, the irritation, the madness, the craziness is in the ventricles, okay? So usually, since our ventricles give us the cardiac output, we don't want the issue to be in the ventricles. We like what we call them to be super ventricular. We want them to be above the ventricles. So I'm cool. If the atria get mad and you give me some AFib, I got that. I know how to treat that. When the issue is actually in the ventricles, I'm a little concerned, okay? Our two ventricular dysrhythmias we talked about was ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. And both of them, ventricles pissed off. First thing I want to do with ventricular tachycardia is find out one or two things. Is my patient dead or alive? Do they have a pulse or do they not have a pulse? No pulse, they don't even have cardiac output. So I need to defibrillate them while there is still electrical activity in the chest. With the pulse, I need to now figure out what's going on because my patient actually could be kind of, you know, not going there. Second thing, antidysrhythmia, oxygen, and we may cardiovert them. That's if they have a pulse. Ventricular fibrillation, CPR, defibrillate. If the defibrillator is right there, defibrillate, 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 defibrillate. Try to get this patient defibrillated first. If you have to go get it, immediately start CPR, guys. Remember, CPR is going to be what saves our patient, which continues to circulate that reserve oxygen in the blood. I know I'm going way beyond, but that is very important. Our new nurses are coming on the floor and not knowing to start CPR. Start CPR. Start CPR. We will come and help you. Start CPR. Um, and so I want you to walk away with that. There are two shockable rhythms ventricular tachycardia without a pulse, and V-fib. If your patient is in a systole, all you can do is CPR and drugs. There is no electrical activity to organize. That's what cardioverting, that is what shocking is all about. Defibrillating is about organizing the chaotic electrical activity. If we're cardioverting, AFib. If we're cardioverting, su tachycardia whatever we're cardioverting we are telling the sa no hey can you do what you're supposed to do but if there is no electrical activity to talk to you cannot defibrillate it so we're not defibrillating asystole the difference between defibrillation and cardioversion is defibrillation is the emergency and can happen anywhere in the cardiac cycle Okay, we don't have to sedate, we don't have to get um, a consent because the patient is basically dead. We got to get them alive. With cardioversion, it may be emergent, 
but the patient may be able to consent. We may even be able to, if they're still conscious, to even get a, um, even sedate them. So think about your patient as in AFib. My stepfather just got cardioverted not too long ago. He was able to, he just was in AFib. Heart rate was in the 120s, 130s. Yeah, he signed a consent. We did the TEE. We anticoagulated. We did all that goofiness. Yes. So that's the difference. It's a smaller amount of energy. It's not always an emergency. Defibrillation, always an emergency. Large amount of energy can be done anywhere within a cardiac cycle. Cardioversion only can be delivered on that R wave. That's why we have to be synchronized. Defibrillation is unsynchronized. Guys, please leave a comment. Let me know if I can explain anything further. Um, subscribe to the channel, and I will talk to you later. Thank you. You can email me at D S H E. M-E-L-L-E at yahoo.com.